W. Armstrong, Tucson-5, Series 8W, Program 8W-17, record date is August 19, 1978, Ambassador Television Productions. Jesus Christ did not come on a soul-saving crusade. Let me repeat that. Jesus Christ did not come on a soul-saving crusade. You cannot find in the pages of the Bible, in the New Testament, one place where Jesus Christ begged and talked and tried to talk someone into giving their heart to him or into being converted. He just didn't do it. The World Tomorrow. The Worldwide Church of God presents The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong. Greetings, everybody. In these televised programs, I have been speaking to you as you have heard no man speak in our time. I have told you why Jesus Christ raised up the church, the real purpose for the church. Now, there are many churches around over the world, but there's only one church of God only one church that was founded by Jesus Christ, and there have been, I would say, literally thousands of counterfeits. The world is full of them. In the Bible, you will read in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation that all nations everywhere all over the world have been deceived. You look in the biblical history, in the book of Acts, you notice the uh, early church and the history of it after Christ founded his church. Then you will learn in the letter that the apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians, that by that time, about 59 A.D., and the church had been founded only in 31 A.D., that they had already turned to another gospel. In other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ that he had brought had been suppressed, and it had not been heard until our time in this 20th century. In all these 1900 years, the world has not heard the gospel that Jesus Christ brought. Now, the gospel means good news, and the gospel is the message that Christ brought rather than man's message about the person. Jesus Christ was the messenger who brought the message. It was the most important message that was ever sent to mankind. It was a message from God Almighty, and Jesus Christ was the messenger that God sent with that message. That message is the gospel, and the world has not heard it for 1,900 years. I know that's hard to believe. It doesn't seem like that's possible. I know there was a cigarette manufacturer that uh, understood how people think and was able to turn it into a television commercial and an advertisement in newspapers and magazines when they said millions can't be wrong because millions smoke that brand of cigarettes. Well, now those millions could be wrong and the government says they are. There's been a little dispute over that lately again <clears throat> as to whether uh, cigarette smoking is a cause of lung cancer. But I think the government is standing pat that it really is. The church was founded on the foundation of the apostles, that is, of the New Testament, and the prophets, the prophets of the Old Testament. And uh, incidentally, something there that very few people realize, the prophets of the Old Testament <clears throat> wrote almost altogether 
for our time now and not for Old Testament Israel. Most of the prophecies were written like the prophet Ezekiel. He was one of the captives by the river Kibar after first Israel had been taken captive and then 120 years later Judah and he was in the Judean captivity. And he was a prisoner. He was not able to get his message out to the people at that time. But he was able to get it into writing. And somehow God saw that it was preserved. And it has remained for a modern Ezekiel to get that message to the world. It was a message for us today, not a message for ancient Israel. And people overlook that fact. So the church was founded on the foundation of the apostles of the New Testament and then the prophets of the Old Testament, and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Jesus Christ had said, as you'll read in the 16th chapter of Matthew, I will build my church. And he said, the gates of the grave will never prevail against it. Now that true church has existed throughout every generation, but it has not been known. As I said, the gospel was suppressed. False churches rose up. And there's only one way that you can ever get the history of the real church of God if you want to know what happened to it through all those generations. That is to look into the records of the false church and see who they persecuted and then check and see if the persecution was for doing the very things that Christ put in his church and in the word of God. Now, wherever you find that uh, uh, people that were branded as heretics, as being anathema from Christ, which is a virtual death sentence, the uh, civil authorities of the government, the police or the military, put them to death. Uh, and wherever you find that they were accused of doing exactly what Christ taught, and that was supposed to be wrong, that's where you find the history of the true church. Now, isn't that revealing? But it is the truth. Herbert W. Armstrong will return right after this message. You're invited to learn more about these important issues through the pages of Plain Truth. This international journal of understanding comes along every month with a penetrating analysis of world views in the light of Bible prophecy. Plain Truth. This full-color monthly publication underscores the importance of biblical understanding in modern 20th century living. Your subscription is free of charge. There is no cost or obligation. Call this toll-free number, 800-423-4444. That's 800-423-4444. The Plain Truth, a magazine of understanding. Now, God gave his church a mission. He called the church for a purpose. It had something to do. People seem to think that the church was called just to, as something to help get us saved. You know, there are the two principles, two ways, broadly speaking, of life, two directions in which we may travel. And the one, the way the world is traveling, I call the way of get. It's the way of self-centeredness, the way of vanity and greed and lust, but toward other people, the way of uh, jealousy and envy and competition and strife. That is the way of Satan. The way of God, though, is the way of love, which is an outgoing concern first in obedience and reverence and worship toward God, and then in uh, helping and in an outgoing concern for the good and the welfare of human neighbors. Uh, that is the give way. <clears throat> so I put it in its simplest terms, the two ways of living. One is God's way, the way of give or love. And love is the fulfilling of that law of God. And the other is the way of get. Now, the world has been 
geared to the way of get, and that has caused all of the heartaches and all of the pain and sorrow and suffering and the mountains of woes and of evils that have piled up higher than Mount Everest or any other mountain in the world uh, by far uh, as a result of that get principle. But God gave the church a mission, and that mission was to back up the apostles. Now, an apostle, the word apostle means one sent forth. Christ first chose students or learners. They became apostles after he had taught them later when he sent them forth with the message that God had sent to humanity through him. Now, actually, that message is good news. It is the only good news of the only hope that this world has and the only sure hope of being delivered out of all of the troubles that beset this world today. And that is through the kingdom of God, which Christ is going to send, and it hasn't come yet. It was in the far future at that time. And Jesus Christ came talking about that kingdom, and it was merely an announcement. It reminds me of a time, and this does go back about uh, uh, 45 years ago, 46 years ago, up in Oregon, and I was out on a country road. It was a time when I was speaking in a country schoolhouse uh, out about eight miles west of Eugene in Oregon, and uh, I encountered a young man. He must have been about 19 or 20, and he says, Oh, Mr. Armstrong, he knew me because I was speaking in that uh, schoolhouse. He says, uh, I thought maybe you'd like to know I gave my heart to the Lord last night. Well, I said, isn't that interesting? I think I've mentioned this before on the program, but uh, uh, I said, well, uh, where, where was all of this? Well, he said, down in the first Christian church. And I said, well, was Christ there? Uh, no. Oh, well, then how did you give your heart to him? Uh, was there uh, was there a surgeon there? Did he perform a surgical operation, cut you open so you could reach in, get a hold of your heart, and pull it out and hand it to someone? Uh, no. Well, 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 then I said, what did you do? What, what do you mean you gave your heart to the Lord? Well, he says, uh, I guess I just don't know. But he had been told by people that he was converted. When you got down to it, he didn't even know anything about it. No, there are many who join the church, many who have said, I accept Christ, but there's much more to it than that. Now, you don't have to agree with it. Christ didn't try to talk people into it. It doesn't make any difference whether people believe it or whether they don't believe it. It doesn't make any difference whether you're for it or against it. It is going to happen because God is going to do it. People aren't going to do it. God is going to send Christ again to this earth to rule all nations and to rule us with the power, the supernatural power of the divine God. And that is a power stronger than any power existing in the whole universe. And he is going to enforce peace. He is going to come and force people to be happy and force people to smile and to enjoy life, and to see how wonderful it can be, and to find eternal life and salvation while we're at it. Uh, now, the gospel was merely the message or the announcement that that is going to come. And God wasn't trying to talk anyone into it at that time. Now, the apostles went forth with that message after the church was founded. And I've already talked about that in the last two or three programs. They went out with the same message. They had received the Holy Spirit of God. And for a little while, the church multiplied in size. But very soon, the great controversy or the persecution set in. And it wasn't very long then until the gospel was absolutely suppressed. The, the, the true church had gone underground. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but in the Bible... There is one place in the book of Revelation, or two places really, where there are two churches mentioned that have happened from the time of Christ on down to now. And uh, the, the church of God, which Christ founded, started in 31 A.D. 
Now, the false church, which is recounted in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, was founded in 33 A.D., just two years later. And they have both existed through every generation down to now. But the one became a very great church, ruling over governments and nations. A popular church, the largest religion, with more people, more adherents, than any other religion on the face of the earth. It took the name of Christ and called itself Christian, but it was not Christian. It was the same old Babylonian mystery religion, and incidentally, you will find back in the books of Kings, uh, in the Old Testament, in the history of where uh, King Shalmaneser of Assyria, when he took uh, Israel captive, had moved them out of their homes in the land of Samaria, which is north of Jerusalem in the land we call Palestine or the Holy Land or the Promised Land, and in the northern part of that land. And he moved people from Babylon in, people of the Babylonian mystery religion, a Gentile pagan religion. Now, they were still there in the time of Christ. And uh, they were, of course, Gentiles. And uh, the Jews that were in Judea, at that time, would have no, no dealings with them. You know, Christ was walking along. He came up to Samaria, which had been the capital city of the kingdom of Israel before uh, Judah split off and uh, formed a separate nation, the kingdom of Judah, in order to retain uh, their capital and their king, their king Rehoboam, and their capital of Jerusalem. But... Uh, uh, here was a woman at uh, Jacob's well, and Christ had been walking a long time, and in those days they didn't have automobiles and airplanes like we do today. And they walked. They walked for hundreds of miles. And Jesus was walking through this land of Samaria back up into Galilee. And uh, he was a little tired, and here was a woman drawing water out of this well. And he said, uh, ask her if she would give him uh, some water to drink. And she looked at him and she said, well now, how does it happen that you, a Jew, she could recognize he was a Jew. A lot of people today say Jesus was not a Jew. Well, this Gentile woman knew by looking at him that he was a Jew. And how does it happen that you, a Jew, ask me, a woman of Samaria, for water? Because the Jews call us dogs. They won't have anything to do with us. And Jesus said, well, if you knew who it is that asked you for that water, you would have asked him for living water. And he would have given you living water. And he said, whoever drinks the water that you have out of this well is going to be thirsty and want a little more a little later. But he said, whoever drinks of the living water that I have to give will never thirst again. Now, he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. And the woman said, well, give me of that kind of water. If you've got something that I'll never thirst again, I'd like to have it. Give me some. What a wonderful opportunity that was for Jesus to try to convert that woman. She said, give me, and he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. In other words, she didn't know that's what it amounted to. She didn't know that the living waters meant the Holy Spirit, but she said, give it to me. Give me, in other words, the Holy Spirit. Jesus could have explained it, but he was not on a soul-saving crusade. Instead of that, he told her what was wrong with her. He said, I tell you, you go call your husband. And she looked rather astonished, and she said, my husband? Why, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, well, now for once you spoke the truth, young lady. Because you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. And she was absolutely flabbergasted. She was astonished. She went into the city and she told people, here was a man that told me all about my life. He seemed to know all about me. And they couldn't understand. Well, he did not try to get her converted. But I want to go into this thing of what conversion is. That is the purpose of this program. Now, Jesus came announcing to the world the good news of this world's only hope and it's only sure hope, which is the coming kingdom of God, to restore the government of God on this earth and to 
uh, enforce the way of give instead of the way of get, to turn people away from this selfish way of getting into the way of giving, into the kingdom of God, which will bring us world peace. Now, it is going to come in our time. Herbert W. Armstrong will return right after this message. From dollars to foreign currency, from yards to meters, from ice to water. There's nothing really strange about the process of conversion. We use it every day as one form adapts to another. Yet when the topic of conversion comes up in a religious context, somehow everything becomes a mystery. Why is that? Just What Do You Mean Conversion is a free booklet that examines this important topic in straightforward, understandable language. You'll see the difference between false and real conversion. What could be more important than conversion from limited physical life to eternal spiritual life? Just What Do You Mean Conversion? There's no cost or obligation. Send for it now. Call this toll-free number. 800-423-4444. That's 800-423-4444. Now you will find in the New Testament that where Peter and John and others began proclaiming this gospel message that uh, God added to the church such as, were, as he had called to be ultimately saved. Now they didn't. You can't find that Peter... Uh, talked them into it. It was not a salesmanship talk. It was not a pitch as we'd call it today. It was not a salesmanship. He wasn't trying to talk anyone into anything, but he told them the truth. He told those Jews who had been responsible for crying out for the blood of Christ and having him crucified what they had done. And of course, uh, they realized it and they said, well, then what shall we do? And when he told them, repent and be baptized, why, 3,000 of them were. But uh, uh, Peter only told them what they had done and told them about this uh, gospel of the kingdom. So the purpose of the church is merely God's means of inducting people in to the church in order that they can have their part in giving and in backing up the apostles and learning this way of giving of life, which is God's way, the way of God's law. Love is the fulfilling of God's law, and giving is simply the way of love. It's outgoing away from self, not incoming lust and greed and vanity and all that sort of thing. I said a while ago, you, you don't hear anyone saying things like this today, and you don't. I can say that without fear of any contradiction. Because I'm preaching the same gospel that Jesus did, and it has uh, been suppressed from this world, and the world has not heard it. Now, as the gospels go forth announcing this gospel message, uh, now this means that that body of Christ, the body of true Christians, are that spiritual organism. But the Bible shows that it is a well-organized spiritual organism. And that uh, requires, if we're going to be in it, the conversion of the members that are in the church as true Christians. There is a duality now of conversion. First, there is a definite time when one receives the Holy Spirit. I don't know how you'd get a little millionth part of the Holy Spirit uh, one minute and a second millionth part the next minute and so on. Uh, uh, in other words, I don't know how in the world you would receive the uh, Holy Spirit of God gradually. There is a time when you receive the Holy Spirit of God. And yet, that is only a start. From that point on, conversion is a gradual process. Now, when people hear me say that conversion is a gradual process, they, they get angry. And they say, well, there is a time when you're converted. Uh, if you have received the Holy Spirit, you are definitely already a Christian. But you're not going to remain a Christian very long if you don't do as Peter said in 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That spirit is given to you to use. I'll explain that now as we go along. There is a definite time when you receive the spirit 
uh, you become a Christian. Well, let me explain that a little further. Is that all there is to it? Far, far, far from it. I want to explain that because you don't hear this kind of thing explained very often. Let's get back to the overall purpose of God in planning humanity and putting humanity on the earth. It is the development in humans of God's holy and righteous character. I have mentioned before how there were angels on the earth before the first man was ever created. The angels were given minds and they were told the truth, but they were able to make their own decision. They rebelled against the government of God that God had put over them. And they turned to the get way instead of the give way. Now, uh, God is simply put, has, has simply put human beings on the earth after his own kind, his form, his image. Uh, man, if you want to know what God looks like, he looks just like a man with the exception that God's face is shining like the very sun, not like our pale faces do. And, uh, but he has uh, a head with eyes and a nose and a mouth and a couple of ears. He has arms and legs just like we do. And we're in the same form and shape as God. But his whole purpose in humanity is to develop that kind of character that God has. It has to come from God, but it must come with our consent. And uh, we must go after it. It's, uh, I've heard it expressed as a gold mine, but you have to go digging for it if you're going to get the gold out of the gold mine. It won't just come to you. The ultimate uh, purpose is to fit us for the most incredible and transcendent human potential that your mind could possibly grasp. But we have to develop that kind of character. God is not going to give us eternal life and give us the tremendous potential that he has uh, allocated to human beings as a potential. We don't have it unless we turn to it ourselves and make the decision and we have to hunger and thirst for it. We have to want it. But uh, uh, it is something greater than angels ever had. We, are, we will be much higher than angels. And, uh, uh, but we have to overcome the way of Satan. We have to overcome that way of get and root it out of our lives. Jesus Christ had to overcome Satan in order to qualify to even proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God and to be the king of that kingdom. Now, if we're to reign with him on his throne, as he says, then we have to also meet and defeat and overcome this Satan whose way is the way of get, the way of destruction instead of construction, the way of taking away from others, the way of getting everything for yourself, the way it says, uh, well, uh, I'm going to stand up for myself. Uh, who, who else is going to if I don't? So uh, it is a final potential so great that it is difficult for the human mind to conceive of what a wonderful thing lies ahead for us. And that is God's purpose. For the free literature offered on this program, write Herbert W. Armstrong, Pasadena, California, 91123. In Canada, Box 44, Vancouver, B.C. Or in the continental United States, you may call this toll-free number, 800-423-4444. That's 800-423-4444. In California, dial direct 213-577-5225. The preceding program and all literature were produced by the Worldwide Church of God.